Hi, I'm Erica Gallantin of Sovereignty Herbs and welcome to my medicine gardens. It has been a spectacularly dry year here in Southeast Ohio. And every year, depending on the weather, the dominance of different plant species will ebb and flow. And so this year, um, it's really a lot of these um, prairie uh, native plant species that have really taken off. Um, and because of that, we have just had the most spectacular garden party of pollinators um, it's just been a wonderful experience to kind of see some of these new species arrive in the gardens. Um, all different kinds of bees, native bees, native wasps, and even flies um, just kind of hanging out and, and doing their thing. So I thought I would uh, take a moment to show you around, uh, show you some of these pollinator plants that are blooming. Some of my favorites, uh, including the wild mints, monardas, and mayhem of the medicine gardens. So one of the first uh, species of plants I want to talk about is this here, short-toothed mountain mint. This is Pycnanthemum muticum. Um, one of my favorite features of this particular wild mint uh, of the Lamiaceae family is this beautiful silvery green foliage um, that really pops in the landscape. Um, it makes for a wonderful companion to a lot of other different um, native species simply because it has this kind of beautiful whiteness or silveriness in its appearance. And these delightful little flowers, these light purple flowers that are just adored by, um, you know, kind of even pretty scary, ugly looking guys like this guy here. Um, and it really is a truly a pollinator magnet. I mean, of all varieties. And I've often heard people talk about how a lot of our native species of uh, pollinators are really fighting with honeybees um, in order to, uh, you know, have access to resources. And honestly, I don't really think that that's the case in my gardens. Uh, I oftentimes see, uh, you know, honeybees as well as wild pollinators just hanging out hand in hand, foraging um, on this beautiful, mm. beautiful, beautiful mint. And um, so there's, there's a couple of varieties of pycnanthemum that all kind of have a different appearance, but um, are similarly as delicious to the pollinators. So this one here is pycnanthemum pelosum. So this is a, a hoary mountain mint. Um, as you can see, it doesn't have those beautiful silvery bracts, um, but it does have kind of a more diffuse um, set of uh, flower heads, if you will, at the, at the top of the plant. And these really, really lovely, slightly furry, uh, lance-shaped leaves. And they're really, really, really delightful. Um, and the flowers themselves are actually um, just a little bit different, but you can still see some similarities here, especially with those purple polka dots, as I like to call them. This last variety of mountain mint here is Virginia mountain mint, or Pycnanthemum uh, virginianum. And as you can see, it definitely is a little more slender leaved even than the, the Pelosum species, but just as lovely and uh, slightly different growth habit. I will say that none of these wild mints are invasive and they are all really wonderfully aromatic. So fun to smell. And this one, um, this is the last mint I want to show you, is um, called Hairy Wood Mint or Blophilia hirsuta. Um, and this was a really a wonderful delight to find as seed in the woods that I then germinated and planted out here in the gardens. Uh, it's just a fun mint, um, really quite a lovely growth habit and an absolute wonderful fragrance. Uh, you can pick the leaves off and um, mm. use them for tea or, you know, just enjoy them um, as you're walking around the gardens, checking everybody out. It's a very refreshing aroma, I will say. Very refreshing. Um, another thing about this uh, wood mint is that it's quite special, um, and I don't know, I just, the pollinators just go crazy for it, although we don't seem to be seeing any right now. So moving on to the monardas in my life, um, <laughs> there are so many different varieties now available in the uh, horticultural industry, so this is 
Uh, one in particular here is one of my favorites. This is um, the wild bergamo or Monarda fistulosa. It has these wonderful pale lavender colored flowers. Um, and, you know, it's really truly um, a unique color in the garden, I think. Here's another variety uh, where they've kind of tweaked the color a little bit. And we're getting a little bit more of the kind of pinks. Um, but, you know, the, the Monarda fistulosa not only has a really long history of medicinal use uh, and culinary use, it is also a pollinator magnet. And then this one here is one of my favorites. This is uh, also known as bee balm. Um, this is the Monarda uh, didyma, which has got this amazing kind of like bright pink, red firework flowers with these gorgeous shades of of chartreuse and I don't even know what colors to call these but just kind of wild and quite wild and crazy um, and they make a really amazing tea so this here is um, the flower heads if you can hear them crunk crinkling crunkling uh, they're all dried up uh, and uh, ready for tea it makes a really nice addition to black tea actually much like Earl Grey flavor and one of the issues that a lot of gardeners have with um, this particular species, uh, didyma, is this, um, this powdery mildew that appears in the leaves uh, when there's not enough airflow in the gardens. And although it's you know, kind of ugly and unsightly and um, you know, it is technically a disease state, it doesn't really negatively impact uh, the population in your gardens. I just say, let it be. And look at all these really cool seed heads. This is these are just each one of these tubes is going to have a wonderful seed in it. Um, so you know this is a really easy plant to start from seed, and I always recommend people, uh, you know, do a little seed saving for themselves. So one of the things I kind of wanted to briefly touch on about you know, incorporating some of these native plants into your gardens. I've heard a lot of people talk about how, you know, they're, they're unruly and they look unkept. And, um, you know, they definitely, a lot of these species definitely have a wildness to them. Uh, that is, you know, not meant to fit within boxes and boundaries. And, you know, that isn't to discourage you necessarily from trying them in your garden if you like a really manicured kind of approach. Um, but it does mean that you have to keep after things a little bit more than you would if uh, you were working with, um, you know, some other kinds of horticultural phenomena. But I think that one thing that I appreciate the most, the most about uh, working with a lot of these native species in the gardens is the mayhem right, is the mayhem, is, is really enjoying and embracing uh, the chaos and seeing it for how beautiful it is, you know. Um, and I, I think that when, for those of us who are, who garden with the heart, right, it's, this is a, a part of our, it's a part of our DNA, it's a part of our mission on this planet is to create sanctuary in our gardens, um, that when we, we let that wildness in, you know, we let the wildness into our gardens, that wildness and that free flowing freedom also is allowed into our hearts on so many levels. I mean, I mean, the, the metaphor of gardening is the metaphor that just keeps giving and giving and giving, um, of course. And so, you know, the idea of working with wildness and um, working outside of normal boxes and lines and boundaries. I, you know, I think that there's often a, a, a soul, a soul stretching challenge uh, and a lot that can be learned from working with plants in this way. And so, you know, you, it, it has taught me a lot about letting go, letting go of the need to control and uh, letting go of the need for structure and everything. And, um, yeah, just letting in some of the mayhem. So speaking of mayhem, here is one of my absolutely favorite uh, native medicinal vines. This is passionflower, passiflora incarnata. And I will say that it likes to spread itself around. Um, that there uh, passionflower castle, as well as all of these wonderful sprouts in the ground, in the grass, in the lawn, 
all came from one plant uh, planted many years ago. So although it's quite aggressive, uh, it does have um, the most spectacular, spectacular flowers. Um, and both the flowers and the vine uh, are used medicinally as a uh, really relaxing remedy, uh, especially for people who suffer from insomnia and anxiety. And it just has the most like wonderful architecture. I don't think there's many things on earth I can say that about. Uh, but passion flowers are very specific, and it's almost as if they were perfectly designed for one of their um, most important pollinators, the carpenter bee. And even though folks don't like having carpenter bees around their home, uh, they don't sting you, of course, unless you grab them accidentally when harvesting the flowers. Um, but they're really funny because they actually almost get drunk on passion flower, and sometimes you can see them kind of taking a nap uh, right there under the anthers. Quite funny. Um, so if you're interested in, you know, growing passion flower uh, to use, especially as a tea, um, you know, you can use the flowers th themselves, um, but they're kind of, you know, sporadic in their appearance. And so it's not like you can harvest a ton all at once. I kind of harvest them as they appear uh, and then dry them very carefully on a screen uh, in a well-ventilated space away from direct heat. And you just pop them off the vine just like that. such an incredible aroma, like rich and sweet and hypnotic, gorgeous. So the last uh, piece of mayhem that I wanted to show you uh, is this amazing uh, native vine, uh, wild yam, Dioscorea villosa. Uh, it's native to, uh, it's a woodland plant, native to uh, the eastern deciduous hardwood forests like here in southeast Ohio. Um, and it has a really uh, wonderful, distinct uh, growth habit um, and really likes a little bit of uh, part shade. This isn't actually really a full sun plant, um, but it does really well if it has some good morning light and evening light. Um, and even tiny pieces of the rhizome you can sprout new plants from, and so it can be really fun to spread around the garden. One of the things that um, is really distinct about this particular species is um, these wonderfully perfect heart-shaped leaves with these parallel veins uh, and the slightly fuzzy, um, as you can see here, a slightly fuzzy uh, hair, hairiness underneath the leaves uh, as well. It's a really unique leaf pattern, um, not very common amongst other species, uh, native species here in the U.S. And Dioscorea villosa is a plant where the pistillate and staminate flowers exist on separate plants. And so you need one of each in order for uh, the plant to be able to reproduce by seed. Uh, so that there are the staminate. And here's what's left over of the uh, pistillate uh, plants. Um, and you can see these kind of swelling ovaries. And it's been a dry year, so uh, things are kind of not growing very quickly and they're desiccating uh, quite a bit. Um, but we have some really wonderful fruits forming here um, on this here. See, this is great. Look at this uh, three-pieced, um, a three-pieced kind of uh, winged fruit. Really quite wonderful. So uh, yeah, wild yam, uh, Dioscorea villosa, definitely one of my favorite pieces of mayhem in the garden. So thank you so much for watching uh, and taking part in this ad wonderful adventure through wild mints, monardas, and mayhem in the July Medicine Gardens. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please feel free to leave a comment. I always love those. And uh, if you're up for it, you can head on over to both Facebook and Instagram uh, and give us a follow at The Medicine Gardener as well as at Sovereignty Herbs. I hope you all have a really safe and lovely August uh, and that it brings you uh, peace and good things. We'll see you next month.